So we'd like to start tonight by recognizing Canada's history of colonization and reflecting on what that history means for us gathered here today. Uh, so we'd like to acknowledge that this sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates, it has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron Wendat and the Putum First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the dish with Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Now, I just want to take a quick moment to contextualize what this statement really means for us and for astronomy. So we learn a lot about um, amazing instruments and facilities and people that do this work, but we rarely stop to consider the histories. What is the history of the land where we build our observatories? Well, where were the raw materials for our detectors ex extracted from? Who directly benefits from the existence of these facilities? Who works there? Furthermore, how has astronomy been used as a means of colonization? How is it still being used that way? And how might you like to see that change? Asking and reflecting on these questions is difficult because astronomy is still being used as a means of, col of colonization uh, across the globe. And we here at Astrocurers don't believe that should go unnoticed. These questions are, to us are as important as the scientific ones that we like to talk about. And when we're talking about the future of astronomy, um, we'll hope that you also take the time to consider this. Uh, so we are uh, committed to engaging and furthering these conversations, so please take some time tonight to talk with our team members or amongst your groups about what land means to you and what it means for astronomy. So tonight we have Hamza Padmanabhan. Um, she is currently a CETA Fellow at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics and an Associate of the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. She was previously a Tamalia Postdoctoral Fellow at the Institute for Particle Physics and Astrophysics in Zurich, Switzerland. She graduated from ICUAA in Pune, India with a PhD in Physics in December of 2015. A top student throughout school, college, and university, she has won numerous prizes and been a recipient of prestigious fellowships at each stage of her career. In particular, having represented her country and won several awards at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair of 2006, and she became one of the few in the world who have the honor of having a minor planet in the solar system being named after her. Probably know that we live in 
the solar system with the sun at the center and the sun is a star, a very average, uh, typical star. And the closest star to our solar system is uh, Proxima or Alpha Centauri, which is about four and a half light years away from us. So for those who are not aware, a light year is the distance that light travels in the span of one year. And if you look at this, this map, it shows you our closest neighborhood, our neighborhood, which is, is basically our backyard, really, in astronomy. And uh, these are some of the stars which some of you may recognize in the night sky. There is Sirius, which is the brightest star. And what you should note about this picture is that the scale, so think of this like a Google map. So you have a scale which tells you how much this kind of distance on this map corresponds to. And what you see here is that this distance is about 10 light years. So basically that's, uh, that's kind of from here to here, for example. And what you will see if you're thinking about scales of this kind is that uh, most of these things are stars and what you see as an arrow is pointing you towards the galactic center, the center of our galaxy. <coughs> And our galaxy, the Milky Way, as it is called, is shown here, which is, uh, I mean, it's a very beautiful and again, a very typical galaxy. It's what is called a spiral galaxy, um, for obvious reasons, because it has these beautiful arms, which are spiral in nature. And each of these arms is made up of a huge number of stars. So there's so many stars in each of these. And in between the arms, you just see empty space, which is just because they're demarcating the places where the stars are, preferentially. And these arms have nice names. Uh, many of you may recognize these as constellations and so on. So you have a Sagittarius arm, and Perseus arm, things like this. And now you see that the scale has changed. And this graph, this map, basically, tells you that this distance is about 10,000 light years, so we've completely zoomed out and we've gone into kind of the scales which are representative of our galaxy, right? And there are some other galaxies around, for example. And the closest galaxy, our neighbor galaxy, so to speak, which is about two and a half million light years away, is called Andromeda. And this is now a photograph of this galaxy. The previous one was, an in, was a kind of drawing because we can't photograph our own galaxy, but we can photograph something outside. And this is a beautiful galaxy with stars and uh, satellite galaxies, which you can see in this figure. If we zoom out even more into uh, grander scales in our universe, what we see is that galaxies organize themselves. So just as stars actually organize themselves into groups, galaxies also organize themselves into what are known as galaxy clusters, or if they're bigger groups, they're called superclusters. So what you see in this figure is the structure of our universe on 100 million light year sort of distances. So what you see is that if you have distances like this, you begin to see that there are places with a large number of galaxies concentrated together, and there are other places which in, are in between in which there aren't that many. So those are called voids, which are between the superclusters. And all these have names. They've all been seen and they've all been kind of classified and so on. And you can see a huge number of them within the space, which is zoomed out about 100 million light years in distance. And the picture doesn't stop there. Because today, with our telescopes, notably in space, with one of them, which is called the Hubble Space Telescope, which some of you may have heard of, and also other telescopes, we're able to actually catalog hundreds and thousands of galaxies, action photographs. And some of these are just shown here as a snapshot, right? So you see that they come, these are all actual photographs of real galaxies. And you see they come in different colors, different shapes, and uh, different sizes, and so on. 
And all of this enables you to study their properties in exquisite detail, which is what we've been doing and uh, we've been doing almost for the last 100 years. Studying all this and classifying these things and understanding their properties led us to what one may justifiably call the discovery of the 20th century. And this was a discovery that the universe is expanding. So now some of you may have heard this statement, but it's important to qualify it because it can be confusing at first glance. When I say the universe is expanding, I don't mean that things in the universe are expanding. That may be happening for different reasons, but really what the universe is expanding means is that things like galaxies on the grander scales, not on small scales, are flying apart from each other, are basically the kind of speed which a galaxy has, which is you know, don't denoted here on this axis, becomes more and more as the galaxy itself is further and further away from us. So really the universe is expanding means that the space itself is expanding and almost, when I say almost, I, I'm putting an almost there because Actually, this on very, very small scales, like the Andromeda is actually coming towards us, but ignoring that, at the larger scales, at the larger scales, the galaxies are all really flying apart, and statistically, this is a true statement. This is a statement you can prove and quantify and uh, back up with evidence. This is a fascinating statement, because it has immediately three consequences which lead to the mind, right? The first consequence is that when I said that the, when we know that the universe is expanding, it isn't static anymore. It is not in some sort of steady state, which means that it must have had a past. So it must have had a history, right? And it must have been therefore smaller in the past. Theory tells us that the universe has been expanding, so it was smaller in the past. Theory also tells us that the total amount of mass or matter in the universe has remained roughly the same. It has not changed much. This means that all that mass must have been packed into a smaller size. Therefore, it must have been denser in the past. It must have actually had more density. And also, normally, when things are denser, they're also hotter. And this is familiar from everyday life. When you have a gas which expands, for example, it kind of cools down. So the universe was indeed smaller, denser, and hotter in the past. And what is the most fascinating is that theory, physics theory, and uh, the general theory of relativity, which some of you may have heard of, actually allows us to describe all these events in the universe in a very precise way. So let me quantify this. So this is a brief history of the universe as we know it today. Okay? And uh, what is fascinating is that we can map out the history of our universe right from the time when it was 10 to the minus 32. So for those who are unfamiliar with this notation, this number is 1 divided by a 1 followed by 32 zeros. Okay? So this is an incredibly small number. And it's that many seconds till today that we can precisely quantify what happened in our universe. So this is amazing. Of course, we want to be ambitious and ask what happened before that. Just as a nomenclature, what happened before that is sometimes referred to as the Big Bang. It's just a name which tells you that we don't know. We don't know because really there is a, a sort of um, field in physics called quantum gravity which starts to operate when things become, you know, close to here, which we haven't figured out completely yet. So it's not any kind of bang in an everyday sense. It's just a word term to say that this period is unknown. But we know almost everything else up to today when the universe was about 13 and a half billion years old and right from here. So what happened about um, a few seconds to a minute in the universe is that the first light elements formed. So you're familiar with hydrogen, the hydrogen atom, and helium, for example. These were the first few atoms which kind of came together, protons and electrons and so on, were around during this time. 
and around about 300,000 years from the birth of the universe, we had what is called as radiation matter decoupling. So what it means is essentially called what is written here, party company in some sense, that when protons and electrons came together and formed hydrogen, the light which was around this hydrogen sort of went in a separate way than the hydrogen. It was not connected to the protons and electrons anymore, which had been the case all the way before this 300,000 years. And this is why it's called radiation septics, which means the light and the matter sort of went their separate ways. Okay? And this was the situation until all the way until about a billion years, which is a very important point in the history of our universe, which I'll spend some time in the next parts of the talk, in which the first galaxies formed. The first galaxies like our own formed, and they basically ushered in the modern day universe. Okay? So how did this actually proceed from the baby universe till today? So this shows you a bit of a schematic here. And what it shows you is that this is like the first radiation that I showed you separated from the atoms at the time of 300,000 years. And what was interesting about this radiation is that it was not uniform. So when I say uniform, what I mean is if you look at different parts of the sky, had you been around 300,000 years after the Big Bang, you would have noticed that the light at different points or just the space at different points had slightly different temperatures and slightly different densities. When I say slightly, I mean 10 parts in a million slightly or one part in a million, very, very, very slightly. Okay? But the interesting thing is that there was only one force available at that time which was dominant and that was the force of gravity. So gravity is a very interesting force and in colloquial terms, what gravity does is to make the rich richer and the poor poorer in some way. Very literally. Because suppose that you have a lot of material at one point, then gravity will attract even more material towards the point where there was material. And in so doing, the places which did have material would become more and more empty. Right? And this is precisely what happened to our universe, which we can quantify today. The smallest one part in a million little, little differences became the huge differences which we see these clusters and super clusters and voids which are so different today simply because of gravity. Okay? And this is a movie which actually tells you how this happened. So you can see the movie will keep replaying. So what you can see is an initially homogeneous kind of uniform density grows with the influence of its own self-gravity to form huge differences between different points. So what you see is initially things were very uniform and gravity is allowed to run basically and this number basically tells you, you can ignore the actual value, but what this number tells you is the timeline of the universe and smaller numbers are closer to today, right? So what you see is that a very uniform thing, if it's slightly non-uniform, can become a universe which has so much of contrast, so much of density difference as we see today. Okay? But now we want to basically put all this together in the context of the biggest questions we can ask about these processes which I told you. So first question is obviously, how did those first galaxies form? Right, the very first galaxies, do we actually know, have a theory to detail, in detail understand this? Second question is obviously a very important one uh, for several reasons. Um, are we alone and could there be intelligent life out there? And a third question which is also extremely important for physics, for cosmology is that all this up to now which I told you was based on Einstein's theory of general relativity. Do we have evidence which kind of goes beyond this theory and is this the ultimate theory? So was Einstein right? Okay. So to answer these questions, we will start by looking at the atoms in the universe over which we have some knowledge and direct control basically. And in some sense, uh, you may have heard this from other astro tools 
and especially notably the previous Astro Tour, if people were around for that, is that the atoms, when I say atoms, technically they are also called baryons, so I will use this term interchangeably, but essentially just think of this as the atoms which you and I are made up of, or all these things and planets and so on are made up of. What we know is that these make up only about 5% of the entire material in the universe. And the rest of it is very fascinating and I won't have time to go into it in this talk. It's basically called dark matter and dark energy, but I'm sure you have and you will hear more about them in other tours. So, this is kind of either depressing or humbling the way you choose to <laughs> think it. I mean, we, are, uh, we are not even made up of the most uh, major component of the universe. What is even more either depressing or humbling is that if you divide even this 5% into what it is made up of, right? What you see is, you can ignore the technical terms on this, but essentially what it tells you is that the stars, planets, all this, is only 7% of that 5%. And the rest of the atoms in the universe are and always have been gas. Gas in different forms, gas in galaxies, gas at different temperatures, pressures with different properties and so on. And this has basically been the case for the last at least 10 billion years. So really this is another uh, important note that uh, stars and galaxies form a very small part Nevertheless, we do understand properties of all this material, so we can ask this question, how did all of this, how did this gas and stars and so on evolve over the <coughs> timeline, the brief history of the universe that I described? So this is essentially what we know today. The gas, because <coughs> of the majority, had underwent two major phase transitions. So when I say phase <coughs> transitions, it's like water turning into water vapor. So there were two things which happened, two events. The first one is the one I told you, which was 300,000 years at that time when light and the neutral gas sort of parted company and they went their separate ways, right? And that ushered in what is known as the dark ages of the universe. Now, dark ages for a very specific reason, because other than this light which sort of was hanging around the gas, there was no other source of light. There were no stars, remember, there were no galaxies, they hadn't formed yet. And so, for about 500 million years or so, there were, basically the universe was dark and invisible. Until the first stars formed which I described in, the, in that uh, movie, right? So we had the first stars kind of coming together and forming, and that ushered in a period which we could call first light, for obvious reasons, and sometimes, just to give a parallel to the medieval renaissance, it's also called cosmic renaissance. So really, it was an end of the dark ages of the universe. It was like, uh, you know, it became uh, all uh, lighted again. And today, we, actually see a very highly, highly re-ionized. So what it means is that we don't have neutral gas anymore and it became completely ionized very soon. And this was the second major phase transition which took place when the universe was about one billion years old. And this is a very important transition. So we're going to spend some time thinking about it in detail. So this is going to be showing you how Exactly, did these first stars create this process by which the universe went through this phase transition? So this movie shows you one single star, a group of a small group of stars at the center, which basically create, you can see this forming, a bubble around them. So what they do is to put out light. So they have light, they emit light. And around them, the gas is completely neutral. And what happens is that this light makes the hydrogen go back into protons and electrons because it can kick out <coughs> the electron from the hydrogen atom. So really, you see that there is a, what is called a bubble forming. So what we call it is that around each of these little stars, you have a bubble which expands and fills up basically the whole universe. So in the next slide, I'm going to just show you the same thing, but also you should look at the left-hand side, which tells you the whole thing on the graph.
Brando scales, right? So this right hand side is the same movie you saw in the previous one, which shows an individual object. And here you see that if you have a bunch of these individual objects around the universe, what they're going to do is to create these bubbles around each of them, and then comes a very important period called bubble overlap. So what happened in the course of a few billion years is that all these little bubbles overlapped with each other and that made the entire universe ionized from being neutral. So that kind of completely put an end to the cosmic dark ages and sort of brightened up everything. So this is precisely how reionization proceeded and this is a movie made out of actual equations and simulations of the universe. But we want to get a bit more ambitious. We want to say, okay, this is great on our computer, but can we see this? Can we actually see this through our telescopes? Turns out that we can. Because cosmologists, as you may have heard, are a very lucky species because we can see the past. <laughs> Again, to qualify the statement, when I look at any of you in the audience, I'm not seeing you as you are right now. I'm seeing you as you were a tiny fraction of a billionth of a second ago because light takes that much time to come from you to me, right? So now imagine that you were standing about one light year away from me, right? I would then be seeing you, an image of you, as you were a year ago because light's taken one year to travel from you to me. Today, we have telescopes which can see about 10 billion to even 12 billion light years in the, in the distant, uh, you know, early time of the universe. This means that they are seeing the universe as it was 10 or 12 billion light years, uh, years ago, right? So basically light coming to our telescopes is coming from a really, really early epoch about 10 to 12 billion light years away just because our telescopes are so sensitive and that is why we're seeing a very early time in the universe and we can actually really observe the way we see the sun or so on. We can see this process in action. We can see different, different phases of our universe in action. So how do we observe the first galaxies, right? The way we practically do this is to use distant objects in our universe which serve as cosmic torches, really. So I told you that uh, we have all these galaxies and some of these galaxies are bright point-like sources which are known as quasars. And this picture shows you the picture of one of these quasars, it's here. And this number just indicates for you that this is a snapshot of the universe taken when it was about one-sixth its present size, okay? So you had about one-sixth or one-seventh its present size. And uh, this, was th this light from that torch is coming through a bunch of stuff like gas and galaxies and other material. And it's coming into our telescopes here on Earth, right? And now, what is interesting is that each of this material which is between us and this, this object, think of it just like a torch which is shining, you know, shining light, leaves a characteristic imprint on that light. So basically, as it comes, you see all these different sort of, say, signatures of materials. So really, each, material, each little thing leaves its mark. And when you see the light, we see it processed, basically. We don't see it as it was when it was emitted. And we know how it would have been when it was emitted. And this means that we can actually precisely quantify what was there or what is there between us and that torchlight and that quasar, so to speak. Okay? And what is interesting is that this is how we can observe that the universe was neutral up to a point and then became ionized the way I showed you in that movie. So you had the neutral universe and it had some signature on that torchlight and then it became ionized and the signature was different. So you can really see that more neutral hydrogen, more absorption. A very interesting way to probe this, to actually see this in action, is by using radio waves. So this brings me to the, the main aspect of what we're going to be studying. And really what you do here is just as you receive signal
signals on your radio, right? So you have something like 300 megahertz, 500 megahertz, and some of you may be familiar with this in terms of centimeters, right? You talk about radio signals, 70 centimeters and so on. Both of those are kind of interchangeable and both of those represent signals which you receive from the earth, so what we can call as terrestrial signals. You get them on your radio. Just exactly like this, it's, the panel is very similar. You get signals from the sky, from the universe, from all these different objects, galaxies and everything into what we call radio telescopes. So radio telescopes, for those who are not aware, is, are just kind of dishes which concentrate these signals and they process them. What is very interesting is that if you have an old analog TV, not the digital ones, the old analog ones, and you hear a small hiss when you detune it, this actually contains a tiny, tiny, tiny component of that radiation which I told you was left over from the Big Bang at the time of parting coming. Because it's all there and some of it you would be surprised that you're getting a part of the Big Bang on your uh, TV when you detune this. Okay? So really the most important um, the most important radio signal which you would like to use is coming from hydrogen. So hydrogen is the most abundant, the most important uh, element in our universe and it's really, it's, and it has been so right from the beginning of the universe. So this hydrogen has uh, the atom, or the atom basically, the atomic structure of hydrogen is characterized by two what we call energy levels. So what it means is that the hydrogen atom has a proton and an electron and this electron can live in one of two levels. So it can either have a higher energy or a lower energy. What happens to this electron is that sometimes it makes a jump from the higher state to the lower state. And when it makes this kind of jump, it emits light. So the atom emits light and that light has a frequency of about 14-20 megahertz. So it's absolutely a radio signal so it's at its wavelength, so that I just mean the length between any of these two things is 21 centimeters, which is a very, very, you know, ordinary number to kind of keep in mind. And this number is plumb in the middle of something like a radio band, right? So you see that the hydrogen which is around us and also in our galaxy, for example, you see this is a picture of hydrogen emission from our galaxy. And what this is telling you is that there is a lot of hydrogen emission. You can ignore the numbers here. It's just telling you that the strongest emission of hydrogen comes from our galaxy because our galaxy, like most galaxies, has a large amount of neutral hydrogen in it. Okay? So this has been done and people do it for several galaxies, and including our own. And this has also been done in various other galaxies. And what you see is that this is one of the galaxies where you see the optical image, which is really the image you'd see with your eyes. So if you had the sensitivity, these are just the stars and so on, like in the first few pictures. And this is the same thing in, in 21 centimeters. So if you were able to see in radio, then you would see something like this. And this is showing you that the hydrogen is a lot more extended than the actual visible stars in that galaxy. And if we were lucky enough to be also able to see in radio with our eyes, this is actually an artist's impression of what we would see. And it would look kind of weird and bizarre because there are lots of objects out there, including galaxies, which emit uh, in the radio band that you would see radio jets, so to speak, and uh, even airplane jets, really. So you'd see all kinds of things if you could see at the radio frequency. And uh, in Canada, there is a huge amount of effort taking place in radio astronomy, especially now and in the next few years. By far, the most important one is located um, about a five-hour plane flight from here at Penticton, BC. And this is known as the... Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, or CHIME. So, Canadian and Hydrogen, 
because it is an experiment which will go after these first galaxies and the reionization and so on and also the neutral hydrogen which is located in galaxies and also within uh, in between galaxies intensity mapping is just a technical term it means that we want to make a map of this hydrogen and we want to make a map at different frequencies and it's an experiment and you can see this is the kind of radio telescope which is used uh, here in uh, for chai and uh, it's uh, it's a very interesting design because it is not this conventional dish kind of design you are all familiar with it is cylindrical in structure and there are four cylinders which uh, really um, are used to um, collect the signal and concentrate it and uh, analyze it for for the research and uh, it's not just canada there are other efforts throughout the world which are going after this first line and going after these radio galaxies and uh, these processes which are taking which took place in the very early universe you have efforts in the netherlands and in india and south africa and so on by far the biggest one is something called the square kilometer array which is located in south which is going to be located in south africa and australia and this is an international venture this is an intergovernmental organization which canada is part of and this is a radio telescope which as the name suggests is going to be the biggest it's going to have this one square kilometer of collecting area so it's a huge 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 effort it's going to be operational very soon and hopefully the next week definitely by the late 2020s and this one of its major aims is what we just talked about probing the time the first galaxies form okay so a little bit more about the square kilometer array just to tell you how gigantic this venture is which all these countries are part of so you one single day's data will take about 2 million years to play back on an iphone so this is a huge huge amount of data which is coming into this telescope right and it's going to have 11 exabytes so this is a term which some of you may not be familiar with i certainly wasn't until a few days ago 5 exabytes is all the words ever spoken by every human being in this world and this is going to have 11 exabytes of data traveling through it from everywhere in the universe every single day and there's de going to be more data in the daily telescope network than the entire internet in this year in 2020 right so it's a huge amount of data which we have a challenge to deal with but it's going to be a huge amount of data revealing so many interesting things for more details you can have a look at the square kilometer array website or the scar website which gives you lot of fun facts about essentially about the science which is going to be conducted with this gigantic instrument with so much data and also about what it means for our our studies in cosmology and our research so this is great so i'm going to give you a taste of what this radio data can reveal to us so what what can uh, we learn from the radio experiments especially with the square kilometer array but also with other experiments The first thing is of course how to see the dark which we also talked about in one of the previous slides. I told you that most of the universe is invisible so to speak because it's made up of it had this dark age period and it had neutral hydrogen and the first stars had not formed until about 500 million years or so. All of this is accessible to us because of the radio waves because we can see hydrogen now we can see this hydrogen coming in as radio signals and what is very interesting is that it can be shown that if you tune the different frequencies of the radio telescope you will be able to access different parts of the universe just because of that first thing which i told you that we can see back into the past right so if you look at this tuning and getting to different different early epochs at every epoch you will see the, a snapshot of the universe so if you put these two things together what you essentially wind up with is a three dimensional picture of the universe happening really in real time and this is what we call tomography 
Some of you in the medical field may be familiar with this term tomography. You may have heard of the PET scan or the positron emission tomography. It's the same thing. What you do in tomography is to have a three-dimensional rendering or a three-dimensional picture of something. Here, we would like to have a three-dimensional picture of our universe. So we're going to have a tomography because we will see different epochs of the universe and we will see the snapshot of the universe, what it was doing at each of these times. The other way of thinking about it is like slicing Swiss cheese. So this is an interesting analogy because we looked at those bubbles and we looked at those um, overlapping regions between ionized gas and neutral gas in galaxies. Really, this kind of radio astronomy allows you to see that in action. So when you see these bubbles forming, which we can sort of simulate in our telescopes, we can really make sense out of it by actually seeing how the radio signals from each of these times came into our telescopes and how they, how, what kind of picture they provided. So it's like slicing Swiss cheese with different inhomogeneous parts of our universe and you can see them. And what is also very interesting is something which I have been strongly involved in, which is that if you look at all the data which we have already today, we are not, not waiting for the square kilometer array or anything, if we see all the data which we already have, we can combine them and we can make up a model to understand how this neutral hydrogen was formed and distributed in the universe right from today all the way up to about four or five billion years from the Big Bang. And this is interesting because this allows us to make a model for distribution of neutral hydrogen and this distribution will inform the next generation telescopes because this is the way to basically forecast or predict <coughs> what kind of design or what kind of telescope structure we should have in order to make the best use of our resources and given the fact that we already know something about our universe, we can basically predict for the next generation telescopes. And a very fascinating um, thing which we can do with this huge amount of data and with the square kilometer array is to actually answer the other couple of questions which we wrote down in one of the very early slides, the big questions which is to give us a deeper understanding of Einstein's theory of gravity. It turns out that there are exotic cosmic laboratories available in our universe. When I say laboratories, I mean objects which are influenced by strong gravitational fields, strong gravity, and this strong gravity is not sort of common and therefore you can use it as a laboratory to test gravity theories. For example, black holes, which many people here may be familiar with, and also objects called pulsars and things like that. And these represent a very interesting test bed, which will become directly accessible with the square kilometer array, and also with CHIME and various other uh, facilities, to ask the very important question, was Einstein right? And finally, we can also uh, think about this really uh, fascinating question whether we are alone in this universe and the way we can do this with this radio astronomical facilities is that there are dusty disks which uh, people call as the cradle of life really which are present around planets and stars, young stars basically and they are detectable at high radio frequencies. So it, it is known that if you had something with the sensitivity of the square kilometer array because it's a huge endeavor so there is a lot of sensitivity. It can actually detect radio signals which are comparable to television transmitters from the closest stars to dozens of light years away. So if somebody is uh, broadcasting something on television for example, then we actually today have the sensitivity to you know look for it or to be um, to be able to detect it, which was not the case in the past. So this may be our clue to understanding uh, whether we are alone in the universe. Right? Okay, so let me quickly conclude what we looked at in the last uh, 40 minutes or so. So I've told you that we are able to observe the furthest, the earliest galaxies which existed in the universe about a few million, one million years to after 
the Big Bang. And these are really, really the earliest epochs. So this was the period which people call the first light, the cosmic dawn, because basically everything was dark and then it became light enough. And this was coming after the invisible period, which is the dark ages of the universe. And it had so much of neutral hydrogen in it, which we can't see by eye. And therefore, we would like to understand all these processes by using radio waves. And we can absolutely do that, because the next generation radio telescopes like the CHIME in Canada and so many other efforts, including the square kilometer array, are going to do this for us. And this is happening now. And it's going to be taking off in a much bigger scale in the next five or 10 years. This is very important because it allows us to understand this, this part of the universe, the distribution, the huge amount of neutral hydrogen across at least tens of billions of years. And this also allows us to answer some of the biggest, biggest cosmological questions facing us today by using the invisible radio universe. Thank you so much. And I'm very happy. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> He's asking how far away the farthest galaxy we know of is. So like I told you, the first few objects, the first few galaxies and so on, were really uh, very close to the birth of our universe. So our universe today is 13 billion years old, so they're very far. So I mean, if most of the time we think about the furthest observable universe being about 3,000 uh, billion light years or so. So that's sort of the kind of number we're talking about. Very high. Yeah. So you said the universe is 13 billion years old, but the furthest galaxy are 3,000 billion light years. So this is because in cosmology, the, when we have the expanding universe, you can't really translate the years to light years as you go back in the past. So you need to use an equation which is not just the multiplication. We can do that happily in our galaxy, in our neighborhood, for Andromeda and things like that. But as you really get to um, further and further scales, we can definitely say that the light is coming from very early epochs, like 10 billion years uh, away and so on, when the galaxy was that young. But you need to be careful when you translate time and distance because it's an expanding universe. Uh, when you talked about um, the yeah, pre-sign and all that, there was a Z that's right. 6.2, and you translated that into one sixth of. Uh, Right, so this is again related, so I'm going to try to explain it um, like in the way which we discussed here. Really what's happening is that you should think of the universe as expanding in size, and so this Z really measures for you exactly how much of a fraction of its present <coughs> size the universe was at that time. So this Z number tells you that the universe was about a sixth. It's technically a seventh, but that doesn't matter. It's about, <laughs> a, sixth. And about a sixth of its present size when we saw that these objects, which we see in our telescopes, were as they are in the photo. So it differs then? Is that differs? Absolutely. Today the, today, the value of Z is actually zero, or I mean, basically, you add one to it, so it's one, basically. Mm -hmm. But in the past, the Z was bigger, and if you saw that uh, that little simulation of that uh, thing, which was uh, the gravity was acting, you saw the Z was changing. So Z is just a marker of chronology, basically. It's just telling well, you it's, it's, it's a date. Yeah, it's a date. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Either Sorry. Qu two questions. One is: Is there any radio telescopes in space? Like there's Hubble. That's my first question. The second is, with all the various radio telescopes on Earth, can you aggregate the data that comes from them to get one sort of picture, if you will? 
Sure. Uh, so let me just repeat those questions. So the first question was whether there are radio telescopes in space, just as we have the optical telescopes in space. And the second question was basically uh, whether we can bring together the data in all of these different radio telescopes to get more information. So they're both great questions. So I'll attempt to the, the first one really, there isn't one as yet, but there are plans to put one of the radio telescopes on the dark side of the moon. And that is a nice plan because that kind of avoids some problems. What we are lucky with radio telescopes, which is uh, an important thing to note, which is not the case with some other uh, sort of bands, because radio is a relatively clean sort of uh, window. So you can see a lot of um, astronomical signals, even though you have the Earth's atmosphere and so on. But it's definitely true that we'll get a lot more when we, if we can put a telescope on the far side of the moon. And indeed, one of the, uh, some of the efforts that I showed you, uh, some of the parallels, the sequels are trying to do that. And the second question is also um, very relevant because it's actually probing a slightly different kind of subject than what I discussed. But if some of you have heard of this first image of the black hole, which was around about a year ago, this was precisely what was done. You take, you use the Earth itself as a what we call a baseline. So what happens in radio astronomy is that if two telescopes are situated further apart, then they can probe a very small their resolution or the kind of <coughs> kind of distance that they can be sensitive to becomes very 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 accurate. So what people did was to actually use the whole Earth as a long radio sort of, you know, arm. And this is how they combined different radio telescopes across different continents and made uh, one of the best pictures which we see. So there is definitely scope to do this. Uh, uh, the 21 centimeter that the, the large array is going to be collecting at, you said that they would be detuning it or tuning to different frequencies to get that tomography going? What's Why? actually going there? Okay, again a great question. So what uh, this is all about is that um, this Z value, or basically the, you can think of it the timeline of the universe, hydrogen always emits at 21 centimeters. It always does that because that's its natural uh, you know, emission. But this emission can get sort of stretched when it comes to us. It's stretched because the universe is expanding. So really every single thing is stretched. Like I said, a wave, which was originally 21 centimeter when the hydrogen emitted it 12 billion years ago, became about 210 centimeters when it came to us or whatever because it was stretched. This means that it corresponds to a different frequency. So it's kind of, uh, so when it got stretched, it became a lower frequency. This means that if you detect hydrogen at this lower frequency, you'd know that it was coming from a different time because it was stretched more. So the more it was stretched, the more we know it's coming from an earlier time. The less it's stretched, we know it's kind of in our backyard. And this is why if we get signals from all these different frequencies, we know what the hydrogen is doing at every single time. And that's how we can get this 3D image. Um, I'm not sure if you answered if you're alone. I did not. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question was I, uh, that she is not sure that I answered if, I, if we were alone. Well, uh, I haven't answered it because the honest answer is we don't know. And uh, we actually did not even have the wherewithal to uh, address this question uh, until probably just now. We're at the cusp of uh, these kind of discoveries. So we have to just watch the space. <laughs> so we'll take one more question.
out at the speed of light, mm -hmm. you would have left the mature universe behind. Right. So it turns out that things are slightly more complicated there. What happens is that the radiation, the light, actually does travel at the speed of light. Yes. But what we see is actually the snapshot of it as it was and not as it is today. So if it was coming to us today, then of course we wouldn't see it. Just the same way as I cannot see anything as it is at this moment because as you said, it's traveling at light speed and I cannot see it because, you know, light hasn't reached there yet. But when I look at the picture of that baby universe, which uh, we were looking at those little fluctuations, those tiny, tiny, you know, differences, we're actually seeing that photograph of the universe as it was all those 300,000 uh, 300, years after the Big Bang. So that is why we are seeing a static sort of image, but really what we're seeing is the thing coming to us precisely at the speed of light, but at, from a very, very early time. And that's how all these different galaxies are also seen by our telescopes. 